I don't like what they've done to the elderly with Ripter. And you better spell it right, too. I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, raising rates on the elderly to get around on buses makes about as much sense as uh, Bill Belichick going to the Giants to be the head coach, which was a rumor online today. Just telling you, I'm not stating any facts, just telling you what's been going on. Uh, but to talk about it and discuss a couple other things that might be important to people who are getting up in years in elderly affairs is longtime state elected, former lieutenant governor, gubernatorial candidate, director of everything. Charlie Fogarty is here tonight, and I'm looking forward to speaking with him. But first, let's go to the rundown and check things out. And I, once again, thank you for tuning in to My State of Mind. If you don't believe it, it's hard to get aggravated by it, right? The headline in North Korea is that they're testing. Here's what CBS says about it. The nuclear blast sparked cheers in North Korea. I condemn it unequivocally. And condemnation around the world. U.S. officials made a flurry of calls to reassure allies. The U.N. held an emergency meeting to plan how to punish leader Kim Jong-un for exploding an atomic device that his regime trumpeted as a hydrogen bomb, a powerful addition to North Korea's arsenal. The U.S. is skeptical of those claims. That initial analysis is not consistent with the claims that were made by the North Koreans that they had successfully conducted a test of a hydrogen uh, bomb. Uh, we have determined that they uh, conducted a nuclear test last night. U.S. aircraft flying out of Japan will now test for radiation to determine exactly what type of device North Korea exploded near the city of Kilju at a site used for its past three nuclear tests. President Obama continued a decades-long policy of slapping punishing financial sanctions on Pyongyang to stop weapons development. And he's also pressured China, Kim Jong-un's main patron, to rein him in. But nothing has worked. It seems to me that these bad guys, if they're not getting a lot of attention, do something to get some attention. And now you put the bad guys in a group of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, North Korea. At least with North Korea, we know where he is. It feels frustrating, doesn't it? It's very different than chasing the chicken with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and like groups. It seems to me that uh, North Korea, which is suffering economically, there's got to be some kind of solution that really brings this guy to the table. And by the way, he probably phonied up the test anyway. Next item, Hebdo anniversary. Yeah, I mean, we've had so much between it. Uh, headline first from the BBC, and then more detail in this headline. I guess this guy walked into a police station, and he really wasn't loaded. He just had a knife. But uh, they're a little tense in France these days, as CBS reports. Cell phone video captured the moment after French security forces shot and killed a man with a butcher's knife outside a police station north of the capital. Authorities say the suspect shouted Allahu Akbar, fueling fear of a possible terrorist attack. Armed officers blocked off Paris streets as the bomb squad moved in. The suspect was wearing a heavy jacket with what appeared to be wires sticking out. But police say the suspicious device turned out to be a fake. French prosecutors say the man carried a piece of paper with the ISIS flag. Locals say the man was known in the neighborhood as mentally unstable. The incident took place on the one-year anniversary of the deadly militant attacks on France's Charlie Hebdo satirical magazine. It comes nearly two months after suicide bombers terrorized the French capital, killing 130 people. You think about the chronology, San Bernardino, then you go back to Paris, and then you go back to Charlie Hebdo, and in the middle of all of that are multiple attacks across the free and not-so-free world that don't get a lot of attention. But it, it doesn't seem like yesterday for Charlie Hebdo, does it? It seems like a longer time than just a year. Uh, back at home here, the governor has offered a really, really bad analogy. And I don't know why nobody has checked her to, uh, to get her facts straight. Here's a headline. Uh, State unveils tentative list of truck toll locations. We talked about that yesterday. And by the way, that is the subject of her entire show for tomorrow night. But uh, Eyewitness News talked with the governor and... Uh, here was her explanation. You know, a few years ago, uh, we had a bridge that we had to weight restrict in Pawtucket. We had a big sign up that said, don't go over the bridge. 
and instead of diverting, truckers routinely paid fines of $1,000 or $2,000, so much so that the state took in more than $10 million in those fines. So I find it hard to believe that a trucker is going to divert to avoid a $20 toll when they didn't divert to avoid a $1,000 fine. Uh, Gov, please, come, come on now. Come on now. If you're going to really get explicit about these kinds of numbers, you've got to get them straight. First of all, they didn't collect, the state didn't collect $10 million. Look at this headline. We did a little research. The Providence Journal has already reported on this. Uh, they may have issued $11.3 million in fines over a five-year period on multiple locations, including the Pawtucket Bridge, which was the largest player in that scheme, no doubt. But the state only collected less than $7 million. Now, you may say, well, that's a distinction without a difference, Dan. She's trying to make a philosophical point. Well, you are got to be good on the numbers if you're going to make a numbers point since you're looking to borrow $1.1 billion to finance a half billion dollars worth of work. And number two, the connection between getting caught on the Pawtucket River Bridge and a 14 gantry uh, plan is hardly the same thing. It's a very wishy-washy foundation that the governor is, is, is using to make her arguments perpetually for this roadworks program. Um, she better get some better arguments because she's beginning to lose her side of it. Next item maybe this is an indication now this is just one state senator in a special election race but here's the headline for this john pagliarini a republican who won this race after a former republican stepped out this dr adiano thought he had a conflict of interest some nonsense i don't know but this guy upset a democrat uh and he says according to headlines in the uh local press and what he said on the radio on wpro yesterday uh actually this morning based on the count yesterday he says it's one issue that got him in we ran ads, we sent mailers, and everything said no toll. And it was unequivocal. They're, they're, to me, it's anti-business. We're going to end up in federal court. Yeah. And only in Rhode Island. Guess what? This guy ran against my guest in 2002. I just heard that out of my ear. We'll cover that amongst many other issues as we go. Charlie's been everywhere. Only in Rhode Island do you get that kind of stuff when you're preparing a rundown for a television show. And lastly... On the seemingly lighter side of things, we got a big controversy on the east side. Have you seen this? Oh, my goodness. How dare he? How dare he run this? I got a solution. This is the carport housing Danny Amendola's car that has everyone talking. Uh, it's ugly. It's, uh, it's very well constructed. I went and banged on it. <laughs> but it doesn't belong in the historic district. Ray Rickman is Amendola's neighbor on College Hill. We're choosing not to show the house Amendola is renting, but Rickman says it was built in the 1700s. So when the carport went up, people were alarmed. They didn't know a Patriot was involved. The neighborhood doesn't like it, and I don't like it either. The Associated Press says Amendola applied for permission from the city of Providence to put up the carport so he can get to practice in Foxborough in a snowstorm. Neighbor Dan Powell says that sounds pretty reasonable. Carport's not really the biggest concern for me. Just imagine having 20 of them. Rickman is a former member of the Providence Historic District Commission and says a carport would typically never be approved. He has a feeling after this, it never will again. The regulations have been tightened, so this will never happen. And he still wants to welcome the wide receiver to the neighborhood. This is our first patriot ever to live in College Hill, as far as I know, and we're happy to have him. Hell of a way to welcome him, Ray. For God's sake. Now, I'm a big Ray Rickman fan. You know, he's been on the broadcast on a number of occasions. He's advocated for some great things, and he's long time been a player. But um, a little snobby, don't you think? It's not like everybody wants a carport on the east side. I got a solution. If we get some snow, Ray drives him to practice. Okay? Ray, you drive him to practice. We'll take the carport down. Because all he wants to do is make sure that Belichick isn't going to make him run suicides because he's late for practice. That's my solution. Hey, listen, uh, we've talked about this before, and now we've gotten kind of a chance to kind of get after it. This headline um, just absolutely made me say, come on, man, can't we do any better than this? And I'm guessing I'll start off on the right foot with Charlie on, on this particular item. Welcome in. Dan, pleasure to be here. Pecorini ran against you when? 2002 for lieutenant governor as a Republican. And he will be a very outspoken senator. Can, uh -huh. And uh, but actually, he and I get along after the fact, and he's been very involved in veterans' issues. So. And the truth of the matter is, is that you you are one of the 
you're one of the old-fashioned guys who can have a good fight in an election race and still get along with people. I mean, you've always, uh, even you and I, we had some good ones, and we, still were, on show, we, we were able to still get over it. Um, yeah. So I like it when there's a little bit of uh, spirit yeah. decor in, in the in the public scene. So that state senator is going to be an active one, you say? Oh, absolutely. Well, since you brought it up, and I don't need a whole bunch of, 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 of opinion on it, and you don't even have to go to the truck toll thing, but that thing is, a, that's a, it's a percolating very public conversation right now, don't you think? No question about it. And I think, uh, but sort of the condition of our roads and bridges. And it's having an impact on Rhode Island's economy. And I think the governor's uh, put forward her plan to do it in a bold way as she's done a lot of things. And now we'll see what the legislature does. Well, you know, and I'll let you off the hook because I didn't bring you here for that conversation. But it actually dovetails in, in some ways. We're talking about transportation. We're talking about RIPTA. We're talking about the public's, you know, responsibility, the taxpayer dollars, where should they go? You know what, why don't we do this? Because I want to have a really comprehensive conversation with Charlie about this. We're going to take a pause. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about why we're tagging the elderly for more money to get around on buses and a whole bunch of other things. Stay with us, please. I want to run this story as a reminder of what the, the premise of the first conversation is all about with Charlie Fogarty. The RIPTA board is looking at it as a compromise, with members voting in favor of implementing a 50-cent fare for low-income elderly and disabled passengers, passengers who usually ride RIPTA for free. Many spoke at a hearing in Providence. All you RIPTA people are a bunch of bozos and a bunch of ripoffs. Right. RIPTA chairman Scott Abadesian says the free ride program is unsustainable. For the elderly program, we get about three and a half million dollars a year, but it's with no Medicaid reimbursement, it's a $20 million expense. Those who use the free ride program say it's a necessity. I totally, totally depend on my bus pass. You know, give us a break. This all I'm asking. The RIPTA board says the new 50 cent fare will go into effect on July 1st. So th this, this is this is the original premise for me to invite the director of elderly affairs here in Rhode Island to to the set. What am I missing here? Well, you know, it is a challenge. Look, RIPTA is not getting all the resources it needs. Um, we have a public transit system that has been underfunded. But on the other hand, you know, from my point of view as director of elderly affairs in the governor's cabinet, we're an advocate for our clients. So this is not just something nice where people get on the bus. This is a matter of getting to the doctors on time, going to meal sites, connecting with people. And Dan, we just recently completed our four-year plan this required under the Older Americans Act. And we had a number of public hearings uh, regarding concerns of our constituents about what they wanted to see. The number one issue that we found was transportation and access to transportation because people are concerned about that. And you know, Rhode Island is an older state. We're the eighth oldest uh, overall. Number one in 85 old and older, which <clears throat> requires uh, additional supports. And over the next 25 years, the next generation, the number of seniors is going to increase by almost 60 percent. So we really need to have a system in place to keep people as independent as possible. And that's what the governor's kind of designated us to help uh, construct is to make sure those services are there. That's one of the reasons we had conversations with RIPTA. That's one of the reasons we're part of the uh, process that will hopefully come up with a better solution than the one that's offered. Yeah, well, so let's cut to it. Raising the rates on, on the elderly, look, I, you know, I, I'm not one of those people who believes, even though I, I make a lot of economic commentary, there are certain things that government should be able to provide because it's a greater good quality of life issue and transportation, you go through some systems in the country, some make a little bit of money, but most of them don't. Most of them are an expense that the community believes adds to the quality of life and the value. And so I don't know, that we've, we've, this state's like hung up on ripped to making money or, or, or being in the black. I don't know that it has to be. No. And one thing I think it's does important. Make, am I, uh, that doesn't make me a bleeding heart liberal, does it? Look, the, I don't have to join your party, do me, I? You're welcome to do that. <laughs> We're a, a big party. I welcome all comers. Um, but anyway, you know, the issue is, you know, certainly the funding hasn't been there, but also we need to increase the ridership from those who do pay the fees as well. The routes are going to be run anyway. But folks talk about, well, gee, 50 cents isn't that much. 
Think about it, though. That's 50 cents is one it, way. If you're in fixed, and it is. if you're a low-income senior, and these are the people we're talking about, very low income, then you get a tr uh, uh, transfer. There's another cost to it. So if somebody's going to the meal site because they want to get the, a nutritious meal to keep themselves, they have to make a donation there as well. So all of a sudden, that little trip is now up to 5 or $6 a day, and they go five days a week. And that's just to keep themselves healthy. If they want to go out and meet a friend, if they want to do anything kind of socializing and not be kind of a prisoner in their own home, uh, they're going to be stuck. So we've got to come up with a way that makes sense. And certainly this is an important piece of the state plan to keep people independent. So what are you doing? I mean, they've made the decision. So what are you going to do? Um, the governor's put together a team, uh, her deputy chief of staff, the deputy secretary of HHS. We're, we're involved, we're actually going to be meeting, I think, next week to look at options and alternatives that we can uh, put forward that will help minimize the impact and hopefully alleviate the need for seniors to do that. I noticed that Senate President Piva Weed also has come out and said that she looks at that as a priority. So within the context of the budget, within looking at other, other options that we can minimize that so that uh, hopefully we can mitigate the impact of that on July 1 and not have it be an unnecessary burden to seniors who want to remain active. Because the rate increase is July 1? July 1. So we've got so this so time. The governor came, you know, the, originally you know it was going to take place immediately and it was going to be a dollar uh, each way. Right. The governor talked to RIPTA, asked them to forestall that till July 1 and then to cut the rate in half initially while the team gets together and looks at options. Well, I, my, my only recommendation to you as you're making your argument is, is, to, tra is to talk in broader terms about this, I think, false objective, which is for RIPTA to make, mm -hmm. to make its nut. I mean, I'd like to see it do better, and, and folks like me can pay more to jump on the bus on yeah. the very occasion that we do, but it doesn't have to, yeah. it doesn't have to be in the black. No. And from our perspective, Dan, one of the things we're looking at, and the governor's kind of asked us to help start the discussion on rebalancing our whole long-term care system, because right now it's heavily weighted towards institutional care, even though most people aren't there, which is very expensive, and most people don't want to do that unless they have to. So part of the ability to remain in the community is having this uh, network of services available to provide people that independence. And we need to do a better job of that going forward. The governor's committed to doing that because if we don't, the cost to the system is going to be unbelievable. Let me just give you a quick example. You know, hold it because I want to come back. He thinks, seems to know a lot about this stuff. He's popped around a couple different gigs. Not bad for early on. We'll be right back. Stay with us. So, uh, Mr. Fogarty is a longtime public official, elected, and bureaucrat. So, you moved from labor to, 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 to elderly affairs. Back to what I was doing in a lot of ways when I was lieutenant governor on long term care issues. You like that stuff? Uh, yeah, and obviously, as I get older myself, I want to make sure all the programs. You get older? Are, uh, yeah. I don't know, you've always been kind of not, not too much up here, yeah, so that's I, like, you can't complain <laughs> that. I mean, I'm getting great with you, but you know. But, you know, so, but uh, yeah, I want to make sure these programs are all set for when I need them. No, but you know, certainly uh, this is issues that are important, I think, to all of us as we age and as we have family members who age. Just, just for those who are interested in government stuff, uh, any common ground between running labor and, and running elderly affairs? Uh, the, other than just being in Rhode Island? And I think the interesting thing was when you run an agency, it's very different than when you're at the State House making policy because you actually have to implement the things that you put that those people place. told you to do. Exactly. And a lot of times what I found, especially when I was at DLT, was that a lot of things that probably made sense uh, when they were passed into law were practically uh, very challenging in putting it into place, and I got frustrated with it. Uh, the bureaucracy can be very frustrating sometimes, but at the time when you put them in, there's always a good reason for it. So what's frustrating about elderly affairs for you? Well, fr frustrating in terms of, you know, and I think the governor shares this too for all of state government, is that things aren't, can't move as quickly as we want. There's a lot of uh, uh, checks and regulations and things that that stymie uh, that stymie change sometimes, and you have to really kind of light a fire under people uh, in some areas to get them moving more quickly than you want. But once you but once you're in there, then you figure out how to do it. I, th th listen, the governor is taking a lot of heat for me on truck tolls and, and a couple other things, but um, maybe it's because their communications people haven't done a good enough job. My thought. But there are some things that I think she is doing in review of operations of state government that make sense and not getting all the attention in the world. What she's doing with the uh, DCYF and and uh, the whole her, lean operation with the cabinet. All of us are involved in all that. that. You know, it's not all bad under the run administration right now. And I think she's taken some steps to actually make government a little bit more efficient. Um, she's got some things that are really covering the front page in discussion. Are you going to be part of that with elderly affairs? Is there going to be some kind of 
wow factor move that's going to happen there that will grab the attention and people see return on investments for the tax dollars? Yeah, I think twofold. Number one, the whole process thing, uh, which may not be exciting to people, but which makes the operations work. All of the cabinet agencies are going to be looking at putting in lean operations to make things move more efficiently. Is there something that you say right now? You say, ah, geez, we can do that better. Well, one, th one, thing we just, uh, one thing we just did, uh, thanks to the uh, um, ideas of one of our folks, we have a, a senior companion program where we have a payroll where we pay people stipends. Uh, the person came up with a way to save $7,000 a year by automating the payroll system and allowing us to uh, focus that person's time and attention on something else. There's Perfect. Just one now example. we don't need the truck tolls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more importantly, Dan, it's uh, in terms of the programs we operate, because we had this year under Secretary Roberts the reinventing um, Medicaid, which is kind of dramatically changing the funding and uh, focused on quality and saving dollars. Now we're looking at rebalancing the long-term care system, where we look at beefing up our home and community support network, because we as a state are way an outlier. Uh, so much in institutional care, very little in home and community care, and it hasn't changed in a long time. It's about 18 Say that percent. slowly. So much on institutional, institutional care. Institutional care, nursing home care, skilled care, and we certainly need that. But, you know, in other states, it's a 50-50 balance. We've been stuck at 18 percent of the re of the resources for, for years now. So we have things like a copay program to provide in-house services for people that meet the income eligibility and the need to keep them at home, just a few hours a week of helping them, uh, you know, with maybe bathing or uh, housekeeping and so forth. We're looking Which at... Which is more cost effective, right? Very, and much cheaper. Um, not only more cost effective, much cheaper. So part of this effort at rebalancing the system that you're going to be hearing from the governor and from, will be a part of that over the next year, is how do we build these up to hope deter people from going into nursing homes unless they really need to, or delay them going in until they absolutely need to do that. That's not only better for them, but that's going to save you and I as taxpayers a lot of money. You, uh, the final thought, I want you guys to come back. When, because listen, True. there's a, a lot of stuff under yes. your auspice right now. But what do you think, um, when, when people listen to you talk about uh, this vast concern of, of elderly affairs, What's the human element of government feel like to, to, to In other words, can they see, can they talk to a Charlie Fogarty about things that are going on? Are they able to reach out and say, my certain situations need this specific kind of attention? Yeah. Is there is there that kind of access, or there is it is. just a vast bureaucracy? No, it is. Telephones? Actually, we are a very small agency. There's 31 people, number one. Secondly, I try to get out as long, uh, as much as I can to our constituent agencies, uh, senior centers, other groups, other advocates. You've got to see what you're yeah, dealing exactly. with. Yeah, uh, exactly. You can read reports, but unless you actually see what's going on, you don't get the full flavor of it. And then finally, I'm in a maybe a unique position having run for office. Um, a lot of people still know who I am, so they have no problem coming up to me right. at church or when we're out to dinner on Saturday saying, oh, by the way, I have a problem with this. Can you check on this? I can't get through. And unless I'm mistaken, knowing you for all the years I have, you like it. You I, like that stuff. I like being able to make a difference in people's lives because for me that's what public service is all about. That's why I'm happy that Governor Raimondo asked me to be in her cabinet in this position. So when do you run for office again? Um, I think those days are behind me. Really? Forever? Let me put it this way, Dan. Uh, you never say never, but it's probably as close to zero as you can get without being zero. I enjoy what I'm doing. Good. I feel it's worthwhile, and um, we have some good people in office right now. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. All right. Pleasure. Final word, and we come back. Stay with us. Charlie Fogarty is one of the good guys, and uh, we should pay attention to some, other this, to some of these other administrative issues that Governor Raimondo has going, if only to be able to look at her first year objectively. Truck tolls dominate the conversation now, and by the way, that's her challenge. And it will be our discussion tomorrow night right back here on Daniel State of Mind. See you on the radio at noon, too. Bye.